Most people who walk through Central Park, New York, from tourists to lifelong New Yorkers, have no idea of the history under their feet. In the early 1800s, New York City was filling up and expanding rapidly. People were desperate for ways to escape the city's chaos. That urgent need for peaceful green space led to the creation of Central Park, which would become a national treasure and model for weaving nature into the big city. But that version of the story leaves out a lot of important information. For one thing, this area in the heart of Manhattan was and is the ancestral homelands of the Lenape people. For another, Central Park's development was only possible because of the forced displacement of Seneca Village, Manhattan's first significant settlement of black property owners. Some might say the creation of Central Park represents the racism and discrimination against blacks that still haunts the United States today. In this video, we'll uncover the reasons behind the destruction of Seneca Village. We'll talk about the successful black people who were there, revealing a history that hidden and meant to be forgotten. It's a heartbreaking story that needs to be heard and remembered. Before we get right into the video, please smash the like button and subscribe to the channel to keep informed of our eye-opening black narrative. Before Central Park was created, the landscape along what is now the park's perimeter from West 82nd to West 89th Street was the site of Seneca Village, a community of predominantly African Americans, many of whom owned property. By 1855, the village consisted of approximately 225 residents made up of roughly two-thirds African-Americans, one-third Irish immigrants, and a small number of individuals of German descent. One of few African-American enclaves at the time, Seneca Village allowed residents to live away from the more built-up sections of downtown Manhattan and escape the unhealthy conditions and racial discrimination they faced there. The formation of Seneca Village, Seneca Village, began in 1825 when landowners in the area, John and Elizabeth Whitehead, subdivided their land and sold it as 200 lots. Andrew Williams, a 25-year-old African-American shoe shiner, bought the first three lots for $1.125. Epiphany Davis, a store clerk, bought 12 lots for $1.578, and the AME Zion Church purchased another six lots. From there, a community was born. From 1825 to 1832, the Whiteheads sold about half of their land parcels to other African-Americans. By the early 1830s, there were approximately 10 homes in the village. More African Americans began moving to Seneca Village after slavery in New York State was outlawed in 1827. In the 1830s, people from York Hill were forced to move so that a basin for the Croton Distributing Reservoir could be built. So many of York Hill's residents migrated to Seneca Village. The reservoir's massive granite walls formed a prominent landmark bordering the village on the east. Seneca Village provided a safe haven during the anti-abolitionist riot of 1834. Later, during the Great Famine of Ireland, many Irish immigrants came to live in the village, swelling the village's population by 30% during this time. Both African Americans and Irish immigrants were marginalized and faced discrimination throughout the city. Despite their social and racial conflicts elsewhere, the African Americans and Irish in Seneca Village lived close to each other. By 1855, one-third of the village's population was Irish. George Washington Plunkett, who later became a Tammany Hall politician, was born in 1842 to Pat and Sarah Plunkett, two of the first Irish settlers at the western edge of the village on Nanny Goat Hill. Land ownership among black residents was much higher than that in the city as a whole. More than half owned property in 1850, five times the property ownership rate of all New York City residents at the time. Many of Seneca Village's black residents were landowners and relatively economically secure compared to their downtown counterparts in the Little Africa neighborhood by Greenwich Village. The economic and cultural stability of Seneca Village enabled the growth of several community institutions. The village had three churches, two schools, and three cemeteries. By 1855, approximately two-thirds of the inhabitants were regular churchgoers. Two of the churches, First African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church of Yorkville and African Union Church were all black churches, while All Angels Church was racially mixed. Census records show that residents in Seneca Village were employed, with African Americans typically employed as laborers and in service jobs, the main options for them at the time. Records also show that most children who lived in Seneca Village attended school. For African Americans, Seneca Village offered the opportunity to live in an autonomous community far from the densely populated downtown. 
Despite New York State's abolition of slavery in 1827, discrimination was still prevalent throughout New York City and severely limited the lives of African Americans. Seneca Village's remote location likely provided a refuge from this climate. It also would have provided an escape from the unhealthy and crowded conditions of the city and access to more space both inside and outside the home. Compared to other African Americans living in New York, residents of Seneca Village seem to have been more stable and prosperous. By 1855, approximately half of them owned their own homes. With property ownership came other rights not commonly held by African Americans in the city, namely the right to vote. In 1821, New York State required African American men to own at least $250 in property and hold residency for at least three years to be able to vote. Of the 100 black New Yorkers eligible to vote in 1845, 10 lived in Seneca Village. However, it was not meant to last. Though successful, Seneca Village existed in a time of racial discrimination where blacks and even the Irish were viewed as inferior. The Destruction of Seneca Village The end of Seneca Village came in the 1850s. During the early 1850s, the city began planning for a large municipal park to counter unhealthful urban conditions and provide space for recreation. Before Seneca Village was chosen to site the historic park, one of the first sites considered was Jones's Wood, a 160-acre tract of land between 66th and 75th Streets on the Upper East Side. The area was occupied by multiple wealthy families who objected to the taking of their land, particularly the Jones and Shermerhorn families. Being wealthy with enough resources to fight the oppression at the time, the families were able to obtain an injunction to block the unconstitutional claim on their land. The residents in Seneca were not so lucky when the members of the city's upper class turned their eyes to the bustling town. In the years prior, the Seneca village community was referred to in pejorative terms, including racial slurs. There was also a smear campaign that was created in the media to gain support of various groups and drive the African Americans and Irish out of their land. Park advocates in the media began to describe Seneca village and other communities in this area as shanty towns and the residents there as squatters and vagabonds and scoundrels. The Irish and black residents were often described as wretched and debased. The residents of Seneca Village were also accused of stealing food and operating illegal bars. The village's detractors included Egbert Ludovicus Viel, the park's first engineer, who wrote a report about the refuge of 5,000 squatters living on the future site of Central Park criticizing the residents as people with very little knowledge of the English language and with very little respect for the law. Other critics described the inhabitants as stubborn insects and used racial slurs to refer to Seneca Village. In 1853, the New York State Legislature enacted a law that set aside 775 acres of land in Manhattan from 59th to 106th streets between 5th and 8th avenues to create the country's first major landscape public park. Clearing occurred as soon as the Central Park Commission's report was released in October 1855. The city began enforcing little-known regulations and forcing Seneca Village residents to pay rent. However, members of the community fought to retain their land. For two years, residents protested and filed lawsuits to halt the sale of their land. However, in mid-1856, Mayor Fernando Wood prevailed, and residents of Seneca Village were given final notices. In 1857, the city government acquired all private property within Seneca Village through eminent domain, the law that allows the government to take private land for public use with compensation paid to the landowner. This was a common practice in the 19th century and had been used to build Manhattan's grid of streets decades earlier. The end of Seneca Village saw roughly 1,600 inhabitants displaced throughout the area. Although landowners were compensated, many argued that their land was undervalued. All of the inhabitants of the village were evicted by 1857, and all of the properties within Central Park were razed. The only institution from Seneca Village to survive was All Angels Church, which relocated a couple of blocks away, albeit with an entirely new congregation. There are few records of where residents went after their eviction, as the community was entirely destroyed. In the 20th century, no one had been identified as a descendant of a Seneca Village resident. Seneca Village's absence was felt during the 1863 New York City draft riots when it could not provide the refuge it did in 1834. Instead, some fled to Weeksville, Brooklyn. 
Some traces of Seneca Village persisted in later years, as workers were uprooting trees at the corner of 85th Street and Central Park West in 1871. They came upon two coffins, both containing black people from Seneca Village. A half century later, a gardener named Gil Hooley inadvertently found a graveyard from Seneca Village while turning soil at the same site, subsequently called Gil Hooley's burial plot after him. The settlement was forgotten for a long time after it was destroyed. The once thriving community and now bore a dark history of destruction, erasure, and the systemic targeting of black wealth. For more than a century, Seneca Village's story was swept under the rug, deliberately left out of history books. The erasure of Seneca Village was a deliberate attempt to erase the accomplishments and success of its predominantly black population. The impressive buildings and achievements of Seneca Village were purposefully downplayed on city maps, creating a negative image that didn't reflect the reality. However, in the late 1970s, Peter Salwin discovered a discrepancy in the records and began to unravel the truth about Seneca Village. His findings were published in 1989 in a book called Upper West Side Story, which shed light on the forgotten community. This sparked some interest, but it wasn't until 1992 when Roy Rosenzweig and Elizabeth Blackmar published The Park and the People, A History of Central Park, that Seneca Village gained widespread attention. Their book explored the rich history of Seneca Village and its importance. In 1997, the New York Historical Society held an exhibition that brought together a group of people committed to uncovering the truth about Seneca Village. This exhibition led to the formation of a nonprofit initiative that continues to this day. The initiative supports research and archaeological excavations, piecing together the fragments of Seneca Village's history. During this time, efforts were made to find descendants of Seneca Village's original residents. One such descendant was Andrew Williams, the first person to purchase land in the village. The Williams family has carried the name through generations, preserving the connection to Seneca Village's past. Ariel Williams, the family genealogist, has diligently documented the lineage, ensuring the story of Seneca Village endures. In 1998, the Seneca Village Project was established as a collaboration between the New York Historical Society, Barnard College, and City College of New York. This project, now under the Nonprofit Institute for the Exploration of Seneca Village History, aims to raise awareness about the significance of Seneca Village as a free, middle-class black community. The tragic fate of Seneca Village serves as a stark example of how black communities were displaced and their wealth systematically destroyed. Seneca Village's demise was not an isolated incident, but part of a broader pattern of urban renewal initiatives that disproportionately affected marginalized communities. The consequences of this intentional displacement and erasure can still be seen today, with higher poverty rates and social issues disproportionately impacting black communities. It is imperative that we confront the uncomfortable truths of our past. By doing so, we honor the lives that were uprooted and the descendants who continue to carry the weight of this history. By sharing their stories and challenging the narratives we've been told, we can make a difference. As always, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to our channel and share our videos to let more people know the truth about blacks and to hear their own part of the narratives. Thanks for watching.